We've got the, the very uh, current and important topic this morning of peace building, um, or should I say this month as the, the Christian Leaders Forum, and we're really uh, wanting to get closer to understanding God's heart for peace and how that plays out in our current situations, how we can pray more effectively as believers and uh, to that end, we've invited three friends to share with us this morning. Uh, we've got Dorcas Etang, um, and she's at UKZN, senior lecturer in political science and the coordinator of conflict transformation and peace studies uh, at the School of Social Sciences at UKZN. Um, she has also extensive experience in international peace building, identity politics, human security and migration. Um, her research focuses on that, on those areas. Uh, she holds a PhD in conflict transformation and peace studies. And uh, we're so blessed to have Dorcas with us this morning. Um, I know Dorcas has another um, engagement a little bit later, so she won't be able to stay till the very end of our meeting and our prayer time together. Um, but she'll be sharing first, followed by Craig uh, Bushier, and uh, just a little bit about Craig. So Craig, he's working with Heartlines. He's an experienced leader working in the church, uh, corporate and NPO um, sectors. He is also a skilled life coach, inspirational speaker, and facilitator. Uh, we've worked for a long time together with Craig and with Heartlines and can honestly say they're a massive blessing, especially in this area of peace building. And so we look forward to, to hearing from Craig. Uh, Craig will also share more specifically around the church's response to the, the riots in KZN last year. And then we have um, the International Director, Director of Scripture Union based in Germany, uh, Monica Kushmiers, and uh, she will be sharing with us more about what is happening on the ground in, uh, in regards to the Ukraine conflict, the war there. Um, they have teams in Ukraine and in Russia and uh, really trusting God for peaceful resolution. Um, it's a massive crisis, which obviously affecting the whole world. And, um, you know, we can just pray that that doesn't escalate even further, but that the Lord can can intervene and bring peace. And, and we uh, look forward to hearing from Monica how we can pray more effectively into that area. And so um, we're very blessed to have these three speakers uh, with all the experience to share with us this morning. I'd like to open in a word of prayer, and then I'll first hand over to Dorcas that will be sharing more in general about peace building and her experience in that field, which will also help us greatly. So let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just humble ourselves before you this morning, Lord, and we thank you, God, for life and life in abundance. We know, Lord, that it's the enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but you have come to give us life. And Lord, you are the Prince of Peace. And we live in a world and in an age, Lord, where there's so much trauma, so much devastation, so much death, so much conflict, Lord. And uh, many times we don't have a clear answer, a clear direction. But we thank you, Lord, that nothing of, of what has happened and transpired in, in recent times has taken you by surprise, Lord God. And we know, Lord, that you have an answer, you have a solution and Lord, that you empower your children, Lord, to be agents of change, to be the, the peacemakers in the world today. And so, Lord, we come together this morning on this call from all over the world. And thank you that we can share with each other, that we can pray together, that your kingdom come and that your will be done. I ask your blessing on our speakers this morning, on Dorcas and Craig and Monica Thank you, Lord, that they've made time to join us this morning. And we pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you'll help us to pray effectively into the current situations uh, which have, have permeated 
um, this world, Lord God, that we are living in in this time. And, and so, Lord, we commit this meeting to you. We pray, Lord, that above all, that you will be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, friends. Uh, thank you for those that have uh, just joined. And um, we will continue now. The program is being recorded and it will be available um, on social media later on. We can send you all the link and you can, we encourage you to share it with your friends as well. Um, we know it's difficult to get everyone on a call at the same time. But without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dorcas. Uh, Dorcas, thank you so much for joining us again. And uh, please feel free to share from your heart. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so my talk will be divided into three key parts. Uh, the first is to give you some insight into my experience in peace building. Um, secondly, to look at the role of the church in, in conflict. And I bring forward examples uh, from Africa on how the church um, has engaged in, in conflict. And then thirdly, um, I will look at some of the ways to facilitate and broker peace, promote reconciliation and contribute to peace building. So my interest in peace building uh, goes way back uh, to when I was completing my master's degree. Um, I had an opportunity to intern um, the political affairs division linked to the UN Security Council. And part of my role as an intern was to go through the decisions made by the UN Security Council and pinpoint and identify how the Security Council's decisions on peace and conflict um, relate to women and children. And so in reading those decisions, um, you know, I was enlightened about the impact of conflict on vulnerable groups and societies. And fast forward um, later, after finishing my master's, I got the opportunity to work with the African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes. Uh, this is an organization based in Durban. And I was in the peace building unit. And our role was to conduct peace building trainings in countries like the DRC, Sudan, Burundi, Liberia, South Sudan. And so every year we would travel to these countries and hold one week peace building trainings. And so we would have 20 to 30 people from um, the city where we're holding the training. And we'll take them through what peace building is, how do you engage in peace building? How do you um, analyze your conflict, um, find solutions to it? How do you set up early warning and preventive measures to prevent conflict um, from occurring and so on? And out of the 20 to 30, uh, participants, we would have representatives from churches, we would have representatives from women's groups, youth groups, um, government, the United Nations mission in those countries, and so on. So um, working in that position really helped me ground myself, establish myself in the field of peace building, and just getting the opportunity to see the effects of violence and war in many of these countries and, and seeing the process of trying to rebuild after so much devastation. And so this has, has triggered my, my interest, uh, my, my work in peace building. And even right now being an academic, I see myself as, as an activist in some way, as a, as a practitioner in some way. And so not just lecturing students, but also educating them on how do you embrace nonviolence as, as a culture, as a way of life, and how do you contribute to peace as well in, in, in your community and, and so on? So that's a bit of context. The second thing is when we look at um, the role of the church in, in conflict, um, one might think the church is, is, is a peace builder um, and so on, right? But when we look at some of the conflicts, on the African continent and even outside the continent, we see that this is not the case, right? Um, the church has done the opposite. Um, secondly, we see that um, religion is such a, a critical um, factor when we look at uh, African society and so on. People wield so much importance to their religion. 
And so because of this, political actors, religious leaders take advantage of this loyalty or commitment to religion and use it to motivate groups to engage in violence and so on. If we look at the case of Northern Nigeria, um, the conflicts have a strong religious component to it. How? Churches have been known to incite violence in their statements. Churches have been used to store weapons that are later used to attack communities that are probably Islamic. Um, churches have, have been used as platforms for political campaigning, right? Influencing who people should vote for and so on. If we look at the Rwanda genocide, where a million lives were lost, the church was one that incited hate, spread messages of hate, uh, burnt down churches. The Hutus, Hutus burnt down churches with hundreds and thousands of Tutsis in it. Um, Christian leaders did not um, protect the, the other ethnic group. And four Catholic priests were indicted by the International Criminal Tribunal for not um, protecting those who sought refuge in the church. In Burundi, we have um, a church body that is very vocal. Um, President Nkurunziza was pushing for a third term, even though the constitution stated that he had two terms only. And the church was very vocal. They, they made this very clear in statements, in, in public engagements and so on. And so the role of the church um, has been varied. And I've sort of set the context of how the church has incited violence and the role it has played in that. And so what are the ways to facilitate and broker peace for the church? Or how can the church promote reconciliation and contribute to peace building? And two questions come to mind for me. The first is, can the church maintain neutrality and be a bridge builder? whether it's the case of Ukraine and Russia, whether it's the case of community-based violence and looting or whatever the case may be, can the church be neutral in that space while trying to be the bridge that brings opposing parties together? Secondly, can the church remain apolitical? The church, whether church leadership, church members, we're all citizens, we're part of our community, we're part of the broader uh, social, space. And so can we be apolitical? And if we cannot, what should be our level of engagement in politics so that we're still seen as, as credible, we're still seen as neutral, but still being political actors? And I think this is a major challenge um, for the church. And, and because of this inability to probably find a balance, we see that the church sometimes is very quiet. The church is very absent in these issues, but we are, we are part of the community. We are part of society. And so what should be our role? And so how do we find a balance by speaking against violence and the destruction of human life, speaking against it, but still calling for peace and reconciliation. And so some of my thoughts are, are one, um, to avoid creating alliances with opposing groups. Okay, in the case of Ukraine and Russia, there's a story or report that the leader of the Russian Orthodox Church is a strong ally of, of Putin. And so there's, they haven't, he has not given a clear stance against the invasion and, and kind of sees Russia and, and Ukraine as being one right? They, they need to be united and so on and so forth. So this is what the church is portraying publicly in, in this instance, right? And so if we want to avoid creating alliances, um, how do we do this? How do we do this? Um, and for me, it all has to be about the vulnerable groups, right? No matter what side you're on, those who are not at the decision-making table are those who are most affected. And that is how the church um, should respond. Another way, apart from avoid creating alliances is to determine who the key actors to the conflict are. If it's at the provincial level, if it's at the national level, who are the key actors, the, the players um, at the conflict? Um, and so we need to identify this at the church, as, as the church and um, begin to find opportunities to engage them. How do we take principles and 
and values of justice, compassion, forgiveness, reconciliation, how do we begin to, to tweak those to, to fit the audience? If we're dealing with political actors, we're dealing with um, community leaders who are sort of at the crux or at the helm of the conflict, um, our church members as well. These are citizens who after Sunday go into their communities. Some of them hold leadership roles in the spaces that we engage with them. How do we bring political issues and political conflict and societal conflict and begin to change their mindsets? And so the, these principles of reconciliation, forgiveness, and so on, we need to now understand how to apply them in the different contexts. And so it, it involves understanding who the key actors are. It, it involves understanding who the key, what the key issues are um, that are causing this. And, and the, the role of education is so critical, right? We must educate ourselves on the political developments that are happening. And this leads me, me to my next point, which is the, what role can the church play in prevention? And this is what we call early warning. Are there signs that something is about to erupt? Are there some conversations that are happening, some activities that are happening that could create more violence and or lead to the, the escalation of violence? And so we need to be in, in that space of prevention. Okay, in the case of Russia and Ukraine, um, of course, we know we're dealing with two quite um, strong individuals with, with strong opinions and views. In, at that high level of political leadership, how can the church begin to engage those individuals right before the onset of, of military invasion? Be it at the community level, at the provincial level, how do we see those warning signs and begin to engage? And that's why when we read the research on peace building, it says peace building is an ongoing process. There's no start and there's no end to peace building. We do not wait for conflict to escalate and go beyond um, our ability to manage it before we start talking about peace. And so if peace building is an ongoing process, then we can prevent violence, we can prevent escalation and so on. So that's prevention in being reactive, right? Sometimes conflict does break out. Uh, parties are not willing to come to the table. What should be the role of the church? I think it's still engaging the key actors, the key actors that are involved in the conflict, um, calling for nonviolence and peaceful engagement, right? This is very critical. And the social media is an, an absolutely necessary tool that the church needs to use. Um, WhatsApp, YouTube, TikTok, whatever the case may be. And, and when we look at the world right now, the loudest voice controls the agenda. And what is the loudest voice? Military acquisition, um, war, destruction, of, of human life. And if that's the only voice that people are hearing, that will shape society. And so as agents of peace, are we trying to be a loud voice as well? Are we trying to use all platforms to push forward principles and values that embrace peace and, and promote peace building? Of course, the church has historically been a support for communities. And when we look at conflicts in Africa, the church has provided support and assistance to vulnerable groups, first aid, household goods, medication, medication food and clothing. Um, church leaders have provided counseling to victims who have lost family in violence. Um, church premises have been used as camps to, to provide support to victims. Churches have donated to, to groups. Um, churches have hosted interdenominational denominational and interreligious conversations, right? And this does not have to be when conflict has begun. Do we need to have these regular spaces for engagement and reflection and how to build compassion and forgiveness and reconciliation? And so conflicts, in conclusion, conflict affects the church, right? It affects all parts of society and is imperative, whether it's the Russia-Ukraine crises, whether it's the looting in July, that the church has a voice, right? We need to speak against the gross violation of human rights. We need to use the different tools that are available to us 
to, to spread that, that message. And I think very importantly, the church cannot remain silent. We must educate ourselves on, on the political, social, economic developments around us. And if we notice some, some little signs of potential um, conflict, how do we begin to engage the right individuals, the right groups to, to switch or, or change the tide from that of violence to peaceful resolution? Um, yeah, so thank you very much. I'll conclude there. Well, thank you, Dorcas, for, for that uh, encouragement and those insights. And yeah, as you say, the church cannot afford to stay silent um, when, when there's conflict around us. And indeed, it's all around us, whether it's in families, in communities, or at an international level. Um, and I like what you said, how the church also really needs to pay careful attention to the cause of the vulnerable. Um, we can see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He, he always had the, the lost, the last and the least uh, on his mind and, and how to support them, how to lift them up and to, to give them uh, a future and a hope. And um, in the same way as the church, we should be agents of that. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Dorcas. Uh, please do stay on the line as, as long as you can. Um, and yeah, uh, we'd love to have you participate as much as you can and also to join us again in future. Thank you so much. Um, now we'd like to um, just invite our friend Craig Bouchier to share with us um, also more specifically on the church's response to the the unrest and the riots that happened in KZN and parts of Kharteng last year in July. Uh, many on this call would, uh, would be familiar with what, ha what happened there and maybe even part of the response. Um, Craig is with Heartlines, uh, organization that us as African Enterprise also partners with in terms of bridge encounters. These are peace talks that are held. And um, yeah, Craig, as we've mentioned, also uh, working with leaders across uh, church and corporate spheres. Craig, you're welcome. Uh, look forward to you sharing with us now. Thanks. Well, good morning, everyone. And Tians, thanks so much for the invitation to join you. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I'm just going to share and, and, and give a little bit of insight into the journey from the unrest in July and to where we are now. And so uh, very soon after the unrest, uh, various dialogues began to take place within the communities of Phoenix, Inanda, and Tazuma, and Kwamashu. And uh, as hotlines with what was taking place, we thought, well, you know, what role do we have to play? And so I began to attend a, a number of these dialogues, uh, really initially just to observe, to see what is taking place, to see who the players are uh, in these conversations, and also to try and identify what can be done and what is their appetite for in the process. Uh, and as that journey uh, began, I think many of you were involved with food distribution, be it from a national level or, uh, or city level. And that was a incredible, for me, an incredible response in that the church was right at the, at the, the spear point of the need that existed in that time. And following that uh, heartlines through uh, sponsorship uh, were able to assist micro businesses that uh, were affected by the looting. Hilal Land played a big part in that. And, uh, and that in itself, and I had many conversations with uh, micro business owners and organizations that were working with them. And I think I'm not sure of the final number, but I think there was probably 80 plus micro businesses that were assisted very quickly during that time, which meant they were able to still live and, uh, and survive. I also thought what was key 
was the fact that in the process with the micro businesses, we did not restrict it to South Africans alone. And so there were many um, uh, foreign uh, informal traders, small businesses that were also able to benefit. And that in terms of report back from uh, people on the ground dealing with that was, uh, that was astounding for them that YAR is an organization that's willing to assist them because they always getting so much pushback in terms of their involvement in the economy. And so these conversations continued. There were conversations with interfaith leaders uh, and parallel to that, there were conversations with the church leaders. And so as we began the journey and so towards the end of August, we uh, began to talk about having a bridge leadership engagement, which is a process that Heartlines uses, uh, where we use storytelling and dialogue as tools to build bridges between key leaders um, in order to resolve conflict and critical issues. And so when the idea was shared with the church leaders, there was an instant uh, response and take up and the question was okay when can we do this and so in September of last year we brought together 28 church leaders it was five from Phoenix five from Inanda five from Montezuma five from Komashu and the other eight were were one or two from from Durban North uh, Amschlange Newlands East it was uh one or two from PMB. And we spent two days at African Enterprise taking these leaders through this uh, bridge leadership process. And uh, it was quite an amazing experience and journey because yeah, you've got a present conflict. Uh, people are looking for solutions and the appetite to engage and to say, well, you know, how, can we get this, these bridges built was very high. And so uh, it was a brilliant engagement for those two days. And we then followed it up with a second bridge engagement, but this time in November, this time we brought together leaders from across the province. So uh, there were leaders from Moy River, PMB, Ladysmith, Newcastle, uh, from Impangeni, so from different areas, but all areas that were also affected by conflict in some way. Yes, we know Durban was uh, the key place and was probably most affected. And uh, there again, just coming together, sharing around story, having this dialogue, taking them through processes that we use uh, we saw leaders hungry for wanting to begin to build bridges. And, and so specifically within the Pinku region, we have continued to meet because at the bridge leadership engagement, a pastor from Komashu had suggested around our last lunch together, you know, why don't we, can't we do a sports day and bring the church together in that way. And so that started something going. And so we started at the end of, in November last year, having meetings. And uh, a few weeks ago, we had the sports day in Inanda and Inanda was chosen really as a strategic venue, both in terms of our political history, but also in terms of the fact that John Dube and Mahatma Gandhi literally lived in the same community in Inanda at the same time and, uh, and were literally neighbors and had many dialogues between each other. And so also Oshlanga High School was the place where Nelson Mandela chose to vote in our first democratic elections. And so very strategic in terms of our history as a nation in moving towards democracy, 
but also I felt very strategic in that uh, John Dubé being a man of God uh, is a key leader from this community. Mahatma Gandhi, uh, who um, was a freedom fighter himself in terms of the passive resistance movement. And so having the sports day in Inanda at JL Dubé Stadium was significant. Also, what was important that we got ministers from Phoenix to cross the bridge to Inanda, because to get the ministers from Inanda to go to Phoenix, not very difficult, very easy, in fact. Uh, and along the journey, you know, I, I could pick up certain fears and certain hesitancy, because initially the idea was, well, we can get a ground here in Phoenix. And, and so we shifted that idea and got them to buy into having it in Inanda. And interestingly, um, the leaders from Phoenix, many of them had actually gone into Inanda for the very first time in their lives. And Inanda and Phoenix are neighbors. It's two communities joined together. I mean, they're literally neighbors. And so that was important. And, and also we're thankful to God that we also got coverage on SABC who came in and, and uh, uh, gave us great coverage on the news channels. But also, as I think Dork has highlighted, is to get that voice heard. To have that voice heard is, is very important, the voice from the church. And therefore, that Sport Reconciliation Day, we restricted it to church leaders um, and, and, and that included the lay leaders within the church, because we said, if we can't get it right, how can we expect the broader community to get it right? So we really need to lead by example. And so the question that uh, has arisen along the journey is, okay, what's next? What do we do next? Because it's, we know that the journey to reconciliation is uh, a journey of many steps. Uh, it's not one event that would take place. And, uh, and so in the process, the, uh, the, the um, uh, idea of, okay, the anniversary is coming up in July. How do you deal with that? Because there's going to be many voices at that time, uh, both, I think, very much from the negative side and the narrative that has been uh, pushed in the media, what, do, what does the church do? How do we deal with the victims? How do we engage them? And yes, we have been uh, providing assistance with counseling and that for the victims, but also what do we do when we get to the one year anniversary? Um, you know, and so uh, using, using storytelling, which is non-threatening, uh, it's very easy to, to move into that process is a wonderful tool to be able to uh, bring about social cohesion. We are also in conversation about having a bridge engagement for the interfaith leaders. And so taking what we're doing as, as church, but taking it beyond that because uh, the unrest has affected everyone. It doesn't matter what your faith is, everybody's affected. And if we can help in that process and bring these interfaith leaders together, taking the journey through story sharing, um, we believe that it will help us to make further progress in the journey of reconciliation. And so that is probably in a nutshell, what has been taking place. So the conversations continue. Um, and uh, we're looking forward to what lies ahead uh, because we know the, the possibility of uh, further uprisings, that exists. The fears within the communities, that still exists. But I do believe we have taken steps towards allaying those fears. We have taken steps that if certain things are are rising that the 
uh, early warning systems will kick in because the leaders are engaged and the leaders are aware so that more can be prevented rather than us reacting to when something occurs. So yeah, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Craig. Uh, thank you for sharing and thank you for all the, the great work that you guys are doing and for always being there to partner in these, uh, in these initiatives. So yeah, uh, as our founder, Michael Cassidy, who's actually also on this call, uh, as he likes to say, nothing happens until people meet. And uh, also a firm advocate for the power of story. So well done, keep up that, uh, that good work. And then, uh, yeah, I must say, I love uh, the potential that sport has to bring people together. Although in terms of conflict resolution, Maybe there's some sports like rugby that might uh, start battles and not actually resolve the conflict. You never know. Um, but thank you for sharing, Craig. And uh, now I'd like to ask my good friend from uh, Scripture Union South Africa, Daryl Henning, to introduce our next speaker, Monica, uh, who's all the way from Germany and joining us. And we'll be sharing more about the, the situation that's uh, developed in Europe. Uh, Daryl, over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, just a delight to be here. And uh, I think most of my life has been uh, either as a volunteer or staff member in Scripture Union, an organization that uh, is 155 years old and started with uh, on the beach in Wales um, with children. And uh, from there, we've uh, it's expanded. Uh, all, all over the world. And uh, it's a delight for me to introduce Monica um, um, this morning with us. Just by way of introduction, uh, Monica was appointed as a Scripture Union International Director in 2017. She's married to Rene and has an adult son. Because of the uh, Russian um, uh, community there. So some of Ukrainians were quite suspicious of what Russia might do. For us, it was, it, you know, in Europe, it came mainly as a shock that Russia really came in with a huge force. But for some Ukrainians who had observed it for a while, they, were, they have been quite suspicious of what might happen over time. Um, in terms of what is happening um, currently, so so the, you you know the fighting is happening mainly at the board, in the border areas uh, from Russia and Ukraine, and Russia is especially interested in the southern part of Ukraine, but at the same time they want to change the government in Kiev um, and put in a Russian friendly government. The expectations have not been met, let's say that, uh, because they didn't expect that Ukraine would fight so strongly against um, the invasion. Um, the, 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 the very painful thing is the humanitarian crisis. So especially the countries in the south um, are in a dire situation. Um, city officials report that 80% of the residential infrastructure in the cities in the south is not is not habitable anymore and most of it is damaged beyond repair and countless civilians are dying every day. Um, officials and medical personnel are suggesting that the real number of casualties um, is much higher than the official number because it is basically impossible to identify and bury hundreds of residents. So it's, it's really a, a horrible war, especially in the South. In the North and especially Kiev, um, the Russian army seems to be um, uh, sending missiles into the city, high rise uh, buildings are burning, but, uh, and there, there are air raids, but the death, the, the um, death rate is pretty low and uh, and Russia is still trying to um, uh, encircle Kiev but it doesn't work pretty well so so the people are under siege but but they they kind of manage as you can say you know uh, at the moment um, in Kiev area um, 
Um, humanitarian convoys are constantly blocked, but um, as of today, uh, we know that more than 3 million people have fled Ukraine to Europe um, through some of the border um, um, countries. And the th <clears throat> thing is that, um, it's, I mean, sometimes it takes like two days for people to wait at the border before they can cross the border because Ukraine, of course, is checking who is leaving the country. Um, only women. Um, or, uh, and children are allowed to leave um, because men between uh, with up to 60 years have to stay in the country to be ready to fight or to be drafted into the military if necessary. So um, we in Europe, we have a huge influx from um, mainly women and children coming into our countries. And they are really traumatized because, you know, from from living in a more or less safe environment to being bomb shelled, um, being uh, uh, running for life, um, it's 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 been a big change of life for them. And um, I have talked to a couple of people who have come to Germany, and they st they say we still can't believe what's going on. It's like if, as if we were still dreaming. Um, uh, we are in a way glad that we are now here in a safe place, but at the same time, uh, we are listening to the news and we are horrified about what is happening to our friends, our family members. I met a girl who said, um, uh, my boyfriend is still in Ukraine and, and every day I'm trying to read the news. It's, it's so painful because I don't know if he is safe or not. Um, Husbands are there, fathers are there. So, so it's families are torn apart. I think this is, um, I mean, in a way, typical for a war. But at the same time, when you are talking to people and hearing this, and you are hearing their stories, it's it's extra painful. So, our you, uh, our team um, uh, is scattered as well because people are responding differently to to the crisis. So, some people said. Um, we want to stay, but we want to hide. Some people said we want to flee. We need to rescue our families, our children, and give them a kind of safe environment if ever possible. So they have left the country. And some are staying and they are trying to help as much as possible. So we have reports from our teams that they are helping um, with others to evacuate, that they are helping the most vulnerable elderly people really who don't have the courage to leave the country and, and, and travel so many miles um, to, to leave. Um, they are trying to feed um, those who don't have anything anymore. Um, Many people are internally displaced because they have left the crisis, uh, the hotspot, basically, and they have fled to other more safe spaces. So the churches are responding really beautifully. I, I think in, in Ukraine, many, many, many churches are, mo <laughs> are more now refugee centers than anything else. And that is something I see as a great encouragement because... Um, from what I heard from refugees coming here, they said the, the, the churches along the road were the places where we felt safe. So even in Ukraine, we were fed, we received a spot where we could sleep. Um, then when we came to the next place, another church invited us to come in and we we had a space where we could stay and sleep and eat and recover for our next part of the journey. And I remember a story one of the girls told me when she was, before she came to Germany, she said, I came to Moldova, a very, very poor country. And then before I left the church to step onto the bus, someone gave me two euros and said, here, take this so that you have some money with you. And she said, that totally broke my heart. And I started to cry because that was a sign how people are responding um, um, with love and care. And even though they don't have a lot, they, they just give. And, and I think the churches are at the moment at their best.
because they are forgetting about their internal theological quarrels um, about, you know, uh, do we believe this or that a little bit more? <laughs> they are just trying to help and serve. Um, and and I'm, I'm really proud of the Christian community, especially in the um, at, along the borders, but also along the way. Um, we are now currently working with um, a, a network of churches in Switzerland. They have they are creating a kind of refugee highway because, and that's one of the issues when refugees are coming to the borders. There are people wanting to help, but there are also already a lot of traffickers along the way. So they because they are women and children, and 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 they are starting to um, invite them to their homes. But but we know already they are you know they will end up in prostitution. They will be you know raped. There will be lots of horrible things happening to them. So what the churches are now trying to do is to create a more or less safe highway. So when they come to a bordering church, then they will be brought to, let's say, Switzerland uh, through various spots where we know that people would be safe. So that is something that the churches have already on their minds. And I'm, I'm, I'm really encouraged to see that, um, that they are starting to to, re, to step up and and you know and 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 we can see God's love through the churches uh, in this horrible situation. Um, we also have team a team in Russia, and that's a totally different situation. So when we met um, uh, for for a prayer meeting, we I, I had to say they we need to pray for them as well because the focus, of course, is on Ukraine, and everybody is with the poor poor. Um, um, country that has been invaded, but at the same time, the people in Russia, they are now suffering from um, um, the, you know, the, the decisions that have been taken. Um, cash machines are not working. Our ministry, uh, our ministries, and many many churches in Russia have been supported by. Um, foreign um, with with foreign money basically, but they can't draw it anymore. They can't get it into the countries. So um, salaries are suddenly cut off, you know, because the money isn't getting into the country anymore. And um, even in the in in Russia, there is a huge. Um, um, uh, division. Um, uh, uh, <clears throat> one of my colleagues in Russia said the whole society is divided into two camps, people who support Putin and people who are against him and against the war. And there is a great tension because people are arguing with each other, other and emotions are running high. It's very complex because everybody has friends and relatives in Ukraine, but then at the same time there is this loyalty towards the government. Uh, and uh, like Dorka said, even um, some of the uh, Orthodox Church leaders, and and so so there is a huge mixture of feelings. Everyone is worried. Um, especially young people, they are against the war and they are part of the protest movements. But of course, that is also very dangerous for them. So once they come together, many of them are arrested. And I recently saw, I heard from my colleague, she said a family was going to um, put flowers um to, to, to lay down flowers at the Ukrainian uh, embassy because they wanted to show that they were um, considering their friends in Ukraine. Uh, and the whole family was arrested, including three children between um, five and 11. So um, so it is very dangerous to speak up against um, um, the war in, in Russia, but, but society is totally divided and even the Christian church is divided. They don't have a clear um, position. And I think, a lot of it has to do, of course, with um, um, with fake information they are receiving through the public um, media, um, so they don't know what is going on. Um, I have to say that the Russian team apologized uh, to the Ukrainian team and said, 
we are not we are not happy with what is happening and going on. Please take our apologies. They are very embarrassed for their country. So so that is the emotional side of it as well. And I was very pleased to he, to read yesterday or the day before yesterday the leader of the. Um, Russian Evangelical Alliance has written a letter of apology to the Ukrainians as well and said, we have tried our best. Um, I have even written to Putin before the war, but it has started now. And now I have to apologize to you. This is not my war, basically. Um, so, so I think there are, the Christian community is trying to, um, to respond well, but there is a tension and division People in Russia are panic buying food, prices in the shops are increasing, the money from outside is not coming, so people are frightened and worried. And um, yesterday I connected with one of our team members there by, by WhatsApp and she said, you made my day. Um, I feel, we feel like in Russia, we are feeling like the bad guys, but that someone is connecting with us and speaking to us, that really, really means a lot to me. So, so that was quite encouraging. Now, um, the neighboring countries, um, of the surrounding nations are quite concerned as well. So we have like countries like Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, they have all been part of the Soviet Union. And they know, and, and over the last years, there have always been provocations by the Russians. Um, so, you know, someone flying across the country, even though it was uh, was not allowed. Um, uh, these countries often have a large Russian population who are pro-Putin. And I know that our colleagues in um, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, they are kind of um, really in fear that something could affect them at some point, not, not straight away, but maybe over the next couple of months or years. So um, that's, that's another issue. Um, for, for the European countries, it is, I think the main European countries, um, the NATO is of course very careful not to provoke anything, but it is painful not to be able to help in Ukraine. And there's, there is this tension, what can we do? We are feeling helpless in a way. Um, as you, if you want to pray for the situation, I can encourage you to pray for churches to be salt and light. I have told you a couple of things, what they are doing. Um, they are serving. Um, but it is hard for them as well. But but I think really that's what we as church or, or God's church are called to be doing, to be salt and light, especially in situations like these. Um, I think we also need to pray for Christians in Ukraine because they are full of pain and it is important that they don't develop hatred. Um, I, I was reading a, a Facebook post from one of my Ukrainian friends and she was writing something, uh, showing a picture of um, a, um, a kind of friend um, who had died. And then she said, I will never forgive the Russians. You know, and I said, I felt like I totally can understand that she is feeling that, but at the same time, I would wish that there would be forgiveness at some point. So, um, so I think it is important that we also pray for our Ukrainian friends that they will not be torn by hatred, but but that they will have this kind of open mind to, um, um, to to let Jesus heal them. I think. And that they then might be able to forgive at some point. So, so I think that's basically one of the prayer items. And uh, and and I think we also need to pray for Russia because bringing financial to support to ministry is nearly impossible. Um, there there might be ways of people going with cash in pockets, but it is dangerous as well. So so that's another item because some of the ministries will cease to exist because they have been funded by outside um, supporters. Um, now, from a global perspective, I think, what is the impact worldwide? What should our response be? 
Um, and I was thinking, we as a Christian community need to learn how to teach and train a kingdom mindset to children and young people, to the next generation, but also to our generation, of course. Because in conflicts or war situations, I think the question is always, to whom does our real loyalty belong? Does it belong to our nation? Or does it belong to the heavenly kingdom? So are we kingdom people or are we national people? And I think the key issue will be that we help to train children, young people, everyone who we are talking with, um, and, and explain to them that our heavenly kingdom is our real identity, our deepest identity, and that because of this identity, we can connect with people who others in our country would maybe consider as enemies. But, but we have something in common, um, our, our, our family membership in Christ, basically. And that is something that is so important to understand. And I think um, in reality, we haven't talked about it enough. Um, I mean, the, as a Christian community generally, because we are so much about our national identity that we often forget get about our kingdom identity. Um, so what we are looking into over time, and it is not for now, but we are kind of thinking about re developing resources for children and young people to look at what God is saying about peace and reconciliation and about who we are and what is important for us to be. Um, and uh, we, the funny and sad thing is we have discussed it uh, a while ago, um, brief a short time before the war even started that we felt a need to do something like that because we have these conflict areas as well in Serbia after the Kosovo war and and you know when people and children from Serbia and Kosovo meet each other there is are still these hard feelings this hatred um, and and we wanted to do something about it or we are we're thinking about Armenia and Azerbaijan where there is exactly the same situation a year ago um, they had a war they were they, they, they had fighting people were dying um, so so we feel there is a need for the Christian community to, to do proper teaching training and helping them to understand where do we belong and how and, and I really like to circle back to Dorcas how can we be um, peace builders how can we uh, help the most vulnerable people because we are people of God's kingdom so that's my bit thank you sure well Monica thank you so much for those insights and for sharing with us um we can, we can sense that as Scripture Union, you guys are very close to the situation and you have people on either side of the border there and our hearts really go out uh, to all the people affected by this ugly war. I think in reality, there can never be a winner in war, but just devastation and, and death, so much loss, so much trauma. Um, and I think you've really opened our eyes today to the situation within the church Um the sentiments, the emotions that are high, um, the need for, for God to, to keep hearts soft and, and focus on, on his kingdom principles and just to, to be ready to forgive every day. Um, also, the, the intense danger for the, the refugees that are leaving the country and, um, you know, those traffickers that are just sort of lying in wait to set traps and yeah, just such a, a, a tragic situation that's developing there. Um, it certainly needs a lot of prayer and every help that the church globally can afford to give uh, these people. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much, Monica. We really appreciate your time and, and uh, the great work that you guys are doing as Scripture Union. Such an amazing legacy. Thank you for the work that you're also doing in our country, in South Africa, um, wonderful caliber of people that you have, like Daryl, that's serving on your teams here, uh, such a friend to us as African Enterprise um, and for the Christian Leaders Forum. So we are going to break into prayer rooms now. Um, 
I'm going to try and uh, just click that button and it's going to sort of randomly put us into little breakout rooms. And then uh, I'd like us to just pray in response to what we've heard this morning. Just the incredible need that our world has in, the, in regards to peace building and the fact that our Lord has given us everything that we need to be his hands and feet in this situation. As Monica said, to be salt and light. Um, and yeah, let's uh, pray also for our country, South Africa, where there's just uh, continuous tension given the poverty in our land. Um, that the Lord can really intervene. And then more especially also for the situation in Europe, Ukraine and Russia, that we can pray into that situation, that we can pray also specifically for the churches, uh, the church in Europe, Ukraine and Russia, um, and that we would follow in the example of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in terms of having that heart of forgiveness, um, that the destitute and, and the broken the separated, that they will be absorbed into the church, that they'll be taken care of, that they'll be protected, um, and that there would be provision for the, the gospel work in all of these countries. Um, let's not forget about the church in, in Russia as well and, and pray for them and that the Lord can use them powerfully in this time. So there's a lot to pray for. Friends, please pray as the Holy Spirit leads you. Uh, these are powerful times of agreement and, and prayer. And so we'll go into the breakout rooms now. Uh, we don't have a, a, a great amount of time to pray together, but uh, we'll pray for about 20 minutes. And then I'll call us back into the main room where we'll close off. And uh, if possible, if Michael is still with us, I'll ask Michael to close for us in prayer um, at the end of the meeting after we come back into the breakout uh, back out of the breakout rooms. Thank you, friends. Um, I'll put us into breakout rooms now.